So we've talked about two conditions that are really common and we're seeing all the time. This is not so common, but we really want you to be testing for it and recognising it. And the change in terminology is probably the big thing in this condition that's happened over the last few years. Those of us who work in the area have been very pleased to wave goodbye to terms like premature menopause and premature ovarian failure because it's really awful to tell somebody in their 20s or somebody who hasn't gone through puberty yet that they've got menopause, that's what their mothers have, and also that they're a failure at anything. And as well as that, it doesn't accurately reflect the condition. Menopause is a complete irreversible loss of the number of eggs in the ovary. And premature ovarian insufficiency isn't that. It's ovarian loss, but it's often fluctuating ovarian function. And women are, can, young women can very clearly go through recovery at different times of their life, and we can't really explain that or control it. So what is the definition? The exact definition of POI is ovarian loss before the age of 40. And there is a big spectrum. So we might see somebody at 16 who's gone through ovarian function loss before they've gone through puberty, through to somebody at the age of 35 who've had surgery to remove her ovaries because she's BRCA gene positive. So there is a large spectrum. In terms of spontaneous POI, Stella gave you some incidents in her first talk this morning. This is the way I think about it, so I think about it in an age-related incidence, and it's pretty rare under the age of 20. The average GP practice may not see many of these, uh, but it becomes more common as women get older, and between 30 and 40, 1% of women will present with a POI diagnosis. And rough figures, 10% of those with primary amenorrhea and 20% of those secondary amenorrhea, again, presenting to a general gynae clinic. Why does it happen? Well, I think the iatrogenic causes are clearly well recognised and for surgery we all know it's going to happen and we plan for it. Women who've undergone chemotherapy or radiotherapy, we should be monitoring those women for loss of ovarian function. But this is often a more insidious diagnosis and we may not be so aware of it. And unfortunately, very often we're left in the slightly unsatisfactory position that we say to young women, we don't really know why this has happened. But about 20% of women will have a genetic cause to their POI diagnosis and about 20% of women will have an autoimmune cause. And for women under the age of 40 who present with a sporadic, spontaneous POI, you need to screen them for thyroid uh, autoantibodies, for uh, adrenal antibodies, and for celiac antibodies, and an annual glucose and HbA1c. We don't do ovarian antibodies, it's not a very accurate test. And if women are positive for one or more of these antibodies, then the autoimmune diagnosis is implied. Many of those uh, idiopathic causes are probably, some of those will fit with viruses or infections. Again, we don't go looking for those. And there is clearly a familial tendency. If you talk to women about the age that their mum went through menopause, often it's a little bit earlier. And I talk to those women about whether they have daughters or not. And if those women have daughters, I tell them that about the age of 20, they should be having a think about their reproductive life plan and fertility planning. And we'll probably be a lot better than we are now at freezing eggs. And they should be talking to somebody about that. OK, so how do we make the diagnosis? This is how we make the diagnosis here officially two FSH levels above 20, one month apart. But if I see an FSH level of 50 or 60, I don't make that young woman wait a month to have another blood test. The diagnosis is pretty straightforward in that situation. AMH level can be used to confirm the diagnosis uh, if you'd like to do that. Symptoms are somewhat insidious in spontaneous POI. 
The iatrogenic women who have had surgery, clearly you're anticipating that, you're going to plan for that, and those women are often very symptomatic. So they go from very normal estrogen levels for their age to really nothing within about two or three days, and they often suffer. But spontaneous POI can be much more insidious and do tend to present with typical symptoms of loss of estrogen levels flushes, sweats, vaginal dryness, sometimes mood change, but can be slow to be picked up. And as part of the diagnosis, we should be doing a carrier type in all women with POI, specifically looking for a fragile X mutation or fragile X premutation, and also mosaic Turner syndrome, which I'm going to talk about in a couple of slides through. Often women with very clear non-mosaic Turner's syndrome have been picked up by the time we get to the POI diagnosis, but not always. Uh, but the mosaic women will often go through puberty and then present with ovarian loss a little bit later. So why are we worried about this? Why do we need to make the diagnosis? And there's many reasons that we need to worry about this. I'm going to talk you through one by one. But this is actually the main reason why we need to worry about this. Mortality at your age of, at, depending on your age of menopause is higher. So if you go through menopause after the age of 50, but you go through menopause under the age of 40 or you lose your ovarian function, your mortality rate is 1.5 times higher without treatment. And that mainly sits in the cardiovascular risk and I'll show you that slide in just a minute. But there's all these reasons why we should be making this diagnosis. This is an emotional diagnosis for women. Every single woman will remember how they were told this diagnosis. And women are very upset and bitter if the diagnosis is delayed. Mm -hmm. So you need to take your time giving this information. You need to see women. You can't give this diagnosis over the phone. And you need to have time to spend with that young woman after having this conversation. So not only is making the diagnosis difficult, but as well as that, there's a suggestion that there are higher rates of low mood and anxiety that go with this diagnosis. And this is not just about a loss of fertility. There are other things women will be anxious about and will grieve. Many women will worry about premature aging and loss of femininity. So it's, and, and some women who have completed their family worry, l grieve the potential loss of choice around further pregnancy. In our younger girls, the girls who are 16, 17 with POI, Often it's just the mums that grieve, not the daughters. The daughters don't completely gather the whole implication of the diagnosis, and it's actually mum that needs the support. And that young woman doesn't really need the support around fertility and all these other things until they're perhaps a little bit older. I think that's sometimes th something we all forget. We know in our heads we've explained the diagnosis, we've talked through the implications, but actually that girl of 16 hasn't taken any of that information on board and needs it all to be repeated in their 20s. Spend time, refer to the websites, the New Zealand and they haven't quite updated their terminology, Early Menopause Support Group Online is a fantastic website. The woman who's run that has put a lot of information together uh, and is a very useful group for women to be made aware of and also psychology support. Cardiovascular risk is the leading cause of death for all women, and it's higher if you go through menopause early. So that slide I just showed you, you can see that most of that mortality is sitting around cardiovascular disease. And if you look at this study, which is quite old now, but it shows <laughs> you this study has used flow-mediated dilatation as a surrogate endpoint for cardiovascular outcomes. And this looked at women who were, had a diagnosis of POI and had not used estrogen for six months before the diagnosis. And here they sit here. And then matched them with a group of control women that were age-matched and BMI-matched. And you can see the difference in flow-mediated dilatation, here's your p-value, in the women with untreated POI compared to our controls. 
And then women were put on estrogen for six months and you can see the difference. And this lost its stati statistical significance when it was compared with the control group. So estrogen makes a difference to women's outcomes and with POI, it's a real reason to treat. Bones are also important. We talked a little bit about peak bone mass with the women with functional hypothalamic amenorrhea earlier this morning. And that's why age of diagnosis is important and why we don't want significant delays to make this diagnosis. So that woman, who, that young woman who's diagnosed before she's gone through puberty won't have reached her peak bone mass and it's something that we need to take into account. Her risk of osteoporosis in the future is much higher than the woman who goes through this diagnosis in her 20s or 30s. The duration of estrogen deficiency is important and it's quite interesting with these very young girls who go through POI before they have gone through puberty or before they've perhaps completed puberty, they don't tend to be very symptomatic from estrogen deficiency symptoms. And I wonder whether you need to complete puberty to get your high levels of estrogen to then suddenly understand that you're physically missing the estrogen. But it's, but so they tend to go on and off their estrogen replacement, as young women tend to do, and because they don't feel any different. So we really need to be supporting those women and educating them that for their bone health and their heart health, they need to stay with their estrogen. Of course, lifestyle measures are important, but estrogen is the best bone forming thing that women have. And there's no place initially at diagnosis for bisphosphonate treatment for almost all of these women. Absolutely, these women are very likely to need bisphosphonate treatment as they age through their 50s or so, but not generally. It's, we generally treat this with estrogen at diagnosis. Fertility, of course, is the thing that most women grieve for and worry about. And this 5 to 10 percent chance of lifetime spontaneous pregnancy is why I am very clear to say to young women at diagnosis this reflects a very small number of eggs in your ovaries. I don't say this reflects a total loss of eggs because it's almost paradoxical to go through all of this and take this woman through this very emotional diagnosis and then say but of course you must use contraception if you don't want to be pregnant. We've all had patients who have had very clear-cut POI and go on and have a spontaneous pregnancy. More common in the first two or three years after the diagnosis, well described, Stella and I have both had patients that have done it. They have very normal children, no high rate of congenital malformation. But we can't control it um, and influence it in any way. And if women want pregnancy, then the most reliable way to do that is to use a donor egg. And in New Zealand, women get public funding for donor eggs so long as they meet the other criteria, BMI less than 32, being a non-smoker and under the age of 40. Uh, and clearly, if you're thinking, if this woman needs ovar ovaries removed, we should think about cryopreservation. <coughs> this is why this is why we are looking for um, the carrier type. Mosaic Turner's syndrome, we don't really understand the incidence of it because there's probably a lot out there that is not diagnosed. So this is where some cells are 46XX and some cells are 46X0 or 46X impaired 46th chromosome. And there is a totally, it, you can have just a small number of cells or a large number of cells, but all of those women are still at risk for the complications of Turner's syndrome. So those women still need to be screened for all of these things. Diabetes risk, hypertension, bone loss, thyroid disease, liver function tests, and that's the main reason for making the diagnosis. You're going to treat their POI anyway, but you need to think about what other things that you need to be screening for. Okay, so there's several things that we think about with regards to treatment and how we're going to help this woman with this diagnosis. So we want to optimize quality of life and treat their menopausal or their estrogen deficiency symptoms. We want to consider the long-term health implications, think about their bones and think about their heart. 
and consider where this woman sits in terms of fertility and what information we need to give her around that. Knowing where your patient is on the spectrum, is this a young girl who hasn't gone through puberty yet and we need to think about pubertal induction regimes? Or is this a woman of 35 who's completed her family and having her ovaries removed will clearly help decide what information you need to give her. And I tell my patients that this is replacing a hormone that if all was fair in the world would still be there. So this is not giving a woman HRT when she is 65, which is what we're going to talk about this afternoon and what is in my, many of our patients' heads but in fact actually replacing a hormone that should be there. Thinking about your need for ongoing monitoring if we have an autoimmune condition and being in there for the long haul. So continuing to provide information and support emotionally is really important. So estrogen is the cornerstone of treatment for these women and the overall international advice is to continue estrogen until the average age of menopause, which is about 50 to 51, and then decisions after that are individualized depending on bones and depending on symptoms. And you can use a combined contraceptive pill or you can use hormone replacement therapy for that woman. And there's no right or wrong in that, and I often give patients choice. Clearly HRT is not contraceptive, so if that woman wants to take advantage of that 5 to 10% chance of lifetime pregnancy, HRT may well be her obvious choice. But if this girl doesn't want pregnancy and she's younger, then the combined contraceptive pill is useful. Funding is also part of it. As you know, you can get a six month script for the contraceptive pill, cost the patient $5. HRT, we can only write three month scripts and cost the patient a little bit more. And that can often be a big part of the decision. Uh, venous thromboembolism risk, if your patient is high risk of venous thromboembolism, you would probably move towards more of a transdermal patch. So there's lots of different regimes you can use and quite commonly women with POI will go through several different regimes to find one that they're happy with. Breast cancer concerns if we're using HRT, which again we're going to talk about this afternoon, is probably high in the mind of the woman that you are treating and so talking to them about that will help allay those fears. There is no increased risk of breast cancer in this group. In fact, there is a thought around that your breast cancer risk relates to your overall lifetime exposure to estrogen, and these women have less lifetime exposure to estrogen. So just standard guidelines for mammography is what we should be recommending. And clearly clot risk, talking about signs of clot to watch out for, uh, and cumulative clot risk, again being a non-smoker and so on. And then I would encourage you to talk to all of your patients, male and female, about their reproductive life plans. This comes from our website, it's our biological clock on the Fertility Associates website and it's quite a powerful tool for young women to understand. If you move this age, then you move this, chance of achieving pregnancy for every month of unprotected sex that you have. And of course, when you move it up to 40, this drops right down. And it's a useful way to combat the media who show all of these celebrities having their pregnancies at 50 and not disclosing the donor egg that they used. <laughs> And there's some interest in using AMH, so there's lots of these nomograms around that suggests that, this is American, but if it suggests if your AMH is here at this sort of age, you'll go through menopause here, um, uh, that doesn't really absolutely translate into clinical practice. This is mathematical modelling, there's no long-term longitudinal data to look at that and it doesn't take into account POI. So we can do AMH but I always couch that with discussion around the fact that age is actually your most significant predictor. And so I think we should be asking all of our patients actually if they've had a thought about when they might be starting to plan for, for pregnancy and babies and how many children they may want to have because the later you have your first child the far less likely you're going to have be to have number two or number three. And I don't think that that discussion is widely happening out there in the health field. 
So this is an uncommon diagnosis, but not making the diagnosis and delaying the diagnosis will have some quite significant health implications for your patient, and I think we should be thinking about it. Please be empathetic when giving this diagnosis because your patient will remember you forever, whichever way you do it. Um, and treatment is really important for long-term health benefits. And encourage all, I actually said women, but I was reflecting this morning and I actually think we should be talking to all of our patients about their reproductive life plan and considering their fertility early.